With all that is happening in our lives, are we taking time to check in? I spoke with one of my yoga instructor friends recently. She reminded me of the necessity of a, a quiet reflection. This quiet reflection practice can take many forms for each of us and every, and every person and requires a level of uninterrupted stillness and serenity. Oftentimes, I find myself reflecting or pondering over current events late in the night and early in the morning hours of the day. It is my sincere hope that you consider the life events that occur in your walk and journey and take a moment to seriously consider your contributions and how your actions and reactions to world events are affecting your inner world and course. The message that is coming through to me, to you this morning, is take time for gentle kindness and lightheartedness. Smell the roses. Take that yoga class or meditation class you have been considering for a while. Take time to write or draw or express your emotions that are inside of you. Each one of us is, a, is valuable, important, and vital to one another's success and growth. We need one another to be stewards of change and architects of peace. Give yourself the gift of quiet solitude and you will reap the rewards. That's my reflection. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Uh, yeah, that particularly hits home for me right now. So I appreciate that. Um, we have someone who's joined us, uh, Arthur. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce your last name and I'd be uh, uh, remiss to try. If you can introduce yourself. Um, Arthur Kigaris, uh, Kigaris. Nope. Hi, I'm Arthur from Long Grove Meeting in Pasadena. <laughs> Great. Good to have you. Uh, and um, I think that's everybody at this point. Yes. So um, uh, we at this point, we normally do um, re reports from our constituent groups, which would be, uh, um, well, uh, we have listed for this week a uh, uh, a meeting of the outreach committee, and I, uh, I want. Uh, I think uh, uh, Michael, is that you? There's... Uh, outreach and advocacy is uh, uh, Carol Francis. Ah, okay. Well, uh, we meet together. It's now the outreach program. Um, uh, ending systemic racism every Friday other than the third Friday, which is the board meeting Friday. Uh -huh. So we invite everybody who would like to work on uh, get setting up a program for the June event that Jody is going to be talking about to meet with us. And we are really excited about what we're doing. So join us. We meet about five minutes after we close here, so you don't need to join a new group. We just take a five minute break and go right into it. Yep. And that would be great for uh, the, the new people that we have on the call. If you can stick around and see what we do, uh, you get to see the nuts and bolts of, of how the organization works. And um, Hopefully, you know, if, you, if you'd like to make a contribution to it as well. So um, let's do this. Uh, so we have um, our speaker. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if, uh, who wants to do the introduction of Jody. I, the, Jody is one of the few people where we really don't have to do an or, uh, a, a introduction, but, you know, uh, we can. Carol Francis, would you like to? Yes, I would. Um, I don't think we need to introduce Jody um, as the, one of the co-founders of Code Pink. We certainly 
don't in this group need to be told what code pink's about. But I was very interested in knowing that she was also a co-founder of a group called 826 LA, which is a group that I'm especially excited about as a retired teacher and as a writer, they teach students from the age of six up how to write stories and tell their lives and put it in writing and get it printed in a book that they put out. So Jody's here today specifically to talk about uh, an event in June that we are co-sponsoring, ICU JP is co-sponsoring and we asked her specifically to come today in order to motivate all of us to get as many ICU JP people out for as much of the weekend program as possible. So Jody. Hi, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> So I thought I was talking about the fog of war, um, um, but I will talk about um, the Peace Summit and how you can get engaged, but I wanna start with why. Um, and thanks for bringing up 826LA because last night I was at our gala 19 years after I founded it with Dave Eggers. And um, I started it because I came home from Washington DC after Congress had voted us to war on an innocent country, an illegal, immoral, and unjust war. And I called up my friend, Dave Eggers, and I said, I need to do something to make sure that someone in America knows how to think critically because Congress doesn't. And um, as we were walking around last night, I was talking to my board members, everybody commented on how much dumber we'd all gotten in the last 19 years. And, um, you know, I talk a lot about the war economy and the peace economy. And um, for me, the 826LA is my peace economy work, um, which um, I look I look to Cuba for, you know, what is, how, how should we be um, in a country that uh, thrives on hate and violence and, um, frightening its people, which is kind of why we started Code Pink. They were, Bush was frightening the American people with code orange and code yellow and code red, and we called Code Pink for peace. But, you know, I looked to Cuba for like, what, what is it like to live in a world where the value is on weapons and intimidation um, and preparing the world for more and more wars, but the, the value is on doctors and teachers and and the essential workers, the, the, what we learned in COVID uh, that we had unfortunately forgotten is what is essential to life. And so for me, that's my expression of what is it, essential for life is, is teachers. And um, I met so many of the volunteers last night that say it's, it's like the nourishment for their souls. It's not like being a volunteer, but it's, it's what gives them the remembrance of uh, a young and bright mind and so um, thanks for bringing that up because that is definitely part of the work for peace and definitely part of the work for getting us out of the fog of war. So um, <clears throat> when I, you know, the fog of war right now is the war on women's bodies. It's the ongoing war on the people of Afghanistan. It's the war on Palestinians. It's the war on Irish Kurds. Um, where bombings continue with bombs that the United States sold to Turkey. It's US drone strikes that continue in Yemen and the people of Yemen who continue to starve to death. You know, the list of, of US engagement in war goes on. Our, the budget is close to a trillion dollars and the US continues its war in the form of sanctions on Venezuela and Afghanistan and Cuba, and that list goes on. But then there's the war economy, war on the planet with our habits that continue to devastate the planet. And those uh, costs get worse every year. War itself is the greatest uh, industrial cause of climate change. 
And then there's the war on the truth tellers, Julian Assange and Ed Snowden and Daniel Hale. But right now there's another war and it's on our empathy and our compassion. It's being weaponized by US militarism. Now I saw this starting a couple of years ago um, at the beginning of COVID where I had been going to China every month to be with my husband who lives there. And for the first year, I would report back in my Facebook and people loved hearing what I was telling in my stories. And they were super curious and open to what uh, China was offering and my, you know, what they were learning. And then um, COVID started to happen and people were hating on me that I was liking China. I was like, this is strange, but it feels very much like the beginning of the Iraq war like everyone's hearts <clears throat> being turned about some against something they didn't know, didn't understand. And they felt really, and it sounded really stupid when they were talking about them. And all that I heard really was hate and othering and um, a sense of hubris about who the person talking was in reference to who they were denigrating. And so I tried, I looked into it and I saw, oh, there's a campaign it's full on because you can tell because the media tells the same story. So they're being told what to say because everywhere you read it, it was exactly the same. And I realized that the, the, the violence that was being spread, the lies and the, and, the, and the propaganda and the exaggerations were being targeted to progressives hearts. They were being targeted to my community to use the hearts, the compassion and the empathy of the people I loved against other people. And now I'm watching that same targeting of empathy and compassion to be used to weaponize as weapons, people that I love who are thinking that sending more weapons to Ukraine is a solution to a problem. People that were old enough to know that we sent weapons to Korea until we, told, we destroyed it. The generals came back and said, there is nothing left to bomb and caused 80% casualties of the people there or the bombs that kept going to Vietnam that we know from Daniel Ellsberg, we knew was wrong. Um, I, I made that movie, Most Dangerous Men in America to remind us that we need whistleblowers um, so here we are in what I call the fog of war. And um, for the past 19, 20, the past 30 years, we've been devastating countries with our we weaponizing of, with weapons and also other forms of violence that we uh, take outside of our borders. Um, including lots of violence to Latin America, which um, I'll get to when we talk about um, the, peace, the People Summit. But here we are in a fog of war and the propaganda is so thick that um, it's, it's hard. I, I, I warn our, our Code Pink team that we're not to talk about what's happening in Ukraine, because first of all, no one knows what's happening in Ukraine, because once starts, the first casualty of war is always the truth. The second is innocent people. But I don't even think the three people with their actual hands on the levers of war, Biden, Putin, and Zelensky, know what's actually happening. So how do we behave as people who live out of love Wear my love t-shirt today. Um, how do we be as peace activists, as, as people of love and care, how do we behave in the fog of war? So I, um, you know, I look to myself and I just be a tuning fork for peace because in the midst of insanity, um, just to remind people as you did earlier um, from your yoga teacher uh, friend. And, you know, what, how can I be? Because 
again, um, I say, you know, we live in an empire that that itself makes us stupid, but um, empire living inside of the culture of an empire also makes us have a lot of hubris, um, not our fault um, because it's the water we swim in, but we have this kind of idea that we can fix the world or we can stop something, but really we are like every other human being on the planet that what we can affect is what is closest to us. And, you know, you know that because ICJP was created around the knowing that peace starts at home, and peace starts in our hearts. And that it really started as a tuning fork for, for peace in um, a world that was going mad around war. And um, so here we are again. And yes, it always starts at home. It always starts with how we can be in a room, who we can be in a room, how we can express ourselves. You know, like right now we need three men to sit at a table, each give something up so the, the war can stop. So the only way this war stops is three men sitting at a table giving up something. And so our work as peace activists is to be peace and diplomacy in a room. It's not to fight about what's actually happening because actually no one knows, except that we do know war kills innocent people. It doesn't end by more bombs and that it's way more complex than anyone in the middle of it can imagine. But it's horrible. It's ugly, it's violent, it's devastating. It rips hearts open and, and it's destructive to everything in its wake. So um, we can know that and we can remember that, but it's kind of strange to think that we think that sending more weapons is gonna solve a problem when we already lost the war in Afghanistan after 30 years. And we think that Russia's gonna be less than Afghanistan. Um, or that we think regime change is a good thing when um, a regime change has usually ended up to be someone even more destructive that takes the place in the midst of chaos. Uh, let's just look at uh, Afghanistan and that there are a hundred warheads in Russia. Whose hands would those fall into that we don't know or can't imagine? So the whole kind of thinking through the process um, and helping people see where we are in the world and what we need to be nourishing. The fact that $22 trillion was spent in the last 20 years on the war on terror made this moment. It made this moment in our cities and the devastation of poverty in our cities and those that are going hungry and homeless. It um, cost us the education of our youth and the education of ourselves that we could be so used has been created by, uh, you know, just think back to 19 years ago where we didn't, we weren't allowed to see even the coffins coming home of the dead soldiers or that our, the US devastation of Iraq um, was worse in the first few days than what Russia did to Ukraine in the first few months. Um, so, here I am with a community of people who live out of love, who live with a dedication to peace. And in the fog of war, what is most needed is our engagement, is our love, is our care, and is our connecting to those who are in our lives to become more visible for peace. And we have lots of opportunities. And I, you know, I, I wanted to talk about Monday, but I'd much rather Rose talk about Monday, you know, that here we have Reverend Barber coming, who is committed, so committed to ending militarism, racism, and poverty. And, and this tour he's on, um, which LA is, is the, the destination on Monday, is about how do we become visible in Washington, DC for peace together? Uh, a big tent of issues that um, the war economy create. And so he's here because 
for a lot of people in California and Washington DC is a long way to go. So this will be a chance for those that can't go to be together, but you know, let's have a great showing. Um, especially like the day after the weekend after a great showing for women's bodies and our, our right for choice and, and to stand against the fascism that, um, you know, I talked about with you a long time ago, many years when I, I talked about the peace economy and I said, when you have global inequality and you have climate change and $2 trillion worth of weapons sold, where does that go? Historically, it's fascism and we see it everywhere across the world, but we see it right now in our own country. The control of women's bodies is fascism. It's here, it has come. But we each get to constantly create the future with our choices every day. And so those choices need to look really visible right now in the fog of war, in what is basically madness. And I'll add one more piece to the madness. And that is that um, members of the leadership of the United States of America, uh, the husband of Ms. Haspel, who's the number two at state, is now trying to tell us that the United States can win a nuclear war. That is a level of insanity that is beyond my imagination. It is so insane. But that the Wall Street Journal published it, that this guy has been pushing it in Washington DC for the last decade and that his wife is at the core of what is happening in Ukraine. She was the one pushing the coup. She was the one funding the neo-Nazis in Ukraine is, is super frightening, super frightening about how our brains can be manipulated and how we can be led to think things that are so violent, so insane. You know. I know many of you have been out, you know, we're out in the 80s where we pushed nuclear weaponry back and back and back. And now, how could we even imagine we would be at this precipice of the leadership of our country thinking it can win a nuclear war? But, you know, I said that many months ago, even before Russia was bombing Ukraine, when the US was pushing Russia on, you know, getting NATO in Ukraine, I was just like, they wouldn't be pushing this if they didn't think they could win a nuclear war. And then two months later, I, I find out that's at the core of this. It's also at the core of the war on China that has been being waged for the last three years. A war on China, why a war on China, why a war on Russia? The United States used to be 25% of global GDP. We are now 16. The only power we have left is the power of weapons and militarism. Shame on us for using that power. China is a billion and a half people. They know that you lose a war when you start a war. That is the, the art of war of the East is that no war starts. And there was a negotiating table just, you know, 75 days ago, where Biden needed to go and say, everyone has to sit here and we have to find a way not to have this war start. And instead they were salivating at the war starting because it meant, ah, we could have a, we could have a regime change in Russia. We've heard from Nancy Pelosi and we've heard from General Austin. So we don't have to pretend anymore that, oh, we're, we don't have fingers on this because they've actually exposed fingers. So there are ways to be engaged together because we know that hate ends. It's ended, you know, I, I look at the United States right now as Hannibal and the Elephants and, and Genghis Khan. If we look at the damage that, that, that we have wrecked across the world, um, it's the kind of damage you read about with Genghis Khan and, and, and Hannibal and the elephants, you know, it's like the same, do you know that we have ravaged countries? Um, 
France is pulling out of Mali. We have, we bombed Libya, left all those weapons, and we don't even tell the story of the damage those weapons are doing in North Africa. Mali, a beautiful, peaceful country with documents of history that went back thousands of years, being literally ravaged. Um, Iraq sent back a hundred years, women sent back to the dark ages that had achieved liberation. Women that had liberation in Afghanistan, back to the dark ages. Um, so um, here we are. We know love, we know peace, and we're called on. It's the time that we're being called because we know hate ends. We know empires end. We're in the end of an empire. Let us be what becomes beautiful about dying empires. Let us not get caught up in um, the hysteria of the moment. It, it takes calm and measured and, and connectivity and like, you know, we say that, you know, what has to happen now is diplomacy, which is connectivity, which is cooperation, which is giving everyone face, not telling stories that create evil and, and, um, and, you know, superheroes. That's not the real world. That's us being used by myths. We're smarter than that. We know it's way more complex than that. We're all being used in Russia, in Ukraine, in the United States and around the world by stories. But I wanna tell you a story that's happening around the world that's quite interesting. There is a non-aligned movement that is coming together around what is happening in Ukraine. And that is the black and brown people and the colored people of the world that see, have seen and have been at the effects of the violence of the white people of the world that have had it and they are not joining in. They're not saying yes to more weapons. They are not saying yes to uh, sanctions against Russia. They're saying, wait, if we do India, um, Brazil, uh, South Africa, three allies, three leaders who were made by US engagement in their countries are saying no, because if you do that to Russia, what are you gonna do to us? If we let that happen, What's gonna happen to us? So there is a new non-aligned movement growing and it is 6 billion people against one. And so we have to look at that and we also have to see who we are. You know, like we need to call out the media because it is making everyone stupid and it is driving this war. Where do you read in the media that it says, why Biden are you not at the table? Why are you not in negotiations? Why are you not there? you know, calling on Putin and calling, you know, nobody knows that <laughs> Russia and Ukraine are at a table, they are negotiating, but that it can't go anywhere without the US because uh, Ukraine can't deliver the end to the sanctions on Russia, which has to happen if, if, the, if, we're, if they're gonna end the bombing. So the, the, the negotiations have to include Biden because the sanctions are, have to be part of the conversation. So the other thing that it's doing is uh, this media is making people around the world angry. Angry that the bombs have fallen on them, angry that sanctions have devastated their lives. But did the media ever expose how horrible that looked for them? Or that Haitian refugees are turned away at the border but white Ukrainians are welcomed in? Or the refugees we created in Latin America with our policies that are at the, you know, at the Mexican border that we won't let in. Or the Afghans, or the Yemenis, or the Iraqis, or the Syrians, or the Libyans. So, so um, it's time for us to engage really visibly. We've nourished each other's hearts by being together. But now it's our job to go out and create, you know, our own peace economy community space where we educate and activate and inspire. And so that, you know, one, the first way you can engage with that 
is on Monday when Reverend Barber comes and being in the street with our communities that are engaging around the Poor People's Campaign, which are quite vibrant and beautiful. And I want to say they're the same communities that are engaging with us around the People's Summit. Now, the People's Summit, we, we started the People's Summit because um, we'd been working on Venezuela and Cuba and you know, you know Honduras and Nicaragua and Colombia and uh, taking back Brazil, which it looks really good for Lula in the fall. Um, and uh, we had started something at Code Pink called uh, the good neighbor policy, which was, could we teach the United States to be a good neighbor? <laughs> But instead, what we heard from Biden was he said, oh, Latin America isn't our backyard, it's our front yard, when, to which Latin Americans said, we are not your anything. You do not own us. <laughs> so Biden's coming out for the Summit of the Americas that hasn't been in the United States since 1994, and it's going to be in our city in Los Angeles, and it's a chance to celebrate that there can be other ways countries can decide to govern themselves and they should have the freedom to do that. That that in a form is democracy where countries decide how to govern themselves instead of been authoritarian regimes like the United States coming in on top of them and deciding how it should be run and by whom. So um, great thing happened uh, the last couple of days is that um, Mexico, has decided not to show up, AMLO's not coming. Because why? Because the United States got to decide who could be at the table. It's like, no, that's not a summit of the Americas, that's a summit of the United States. And so he said, I'm not coming if that, you know, if, if this isn't about us, all of us, and we're not treated in some way respectfully, we need respect. And that's really what the People's Summit is about. What does respect look like? What does care for the people look like? And so um, we have people coming up from um, many Latin American countries who are activists in the streets in those countries. They will be speaking to us. Um, we have uh, representatives of governments coming to speak to us. We will certainly have representatives of the governments that are not being invited to the table of the, the Summit of the Americas. Um, and so it's a chance to come together and be in solidarity with our neighbors as people who respect, who um, are you know, in awe of what they've been able to accomplish, even with the foot, uh, the, 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 the boot on the neck of, of their lives. Um, you know, to, it's just an opportunity to be what we need from others. And um, it's, we have a great program. Uh, we'll have um, awesome speakers. Um, we have a, a whole cultural program. Uh, the, the, the team at Trade Tech has just um, bent over backwards to make this be a beautiful time, a beautiful gathering, a beautiful way to be together and be inspired by each other, by, by, our, by the cultures, by um, by making art together, by learning about the arts of, of other countries, by hearing from artists of, from other countries, by re being reminded that um, art is a revolutionary tool. Um, so, uh, and really it's, you know, it's to come and to be audience, to bring friends, to be in solidarity, to be the, the, the peacemakers from this community, meeting the peacemakers from other communities. We have, um, a group of 13 women traveling from Venezuela, um, you'll get to hear from. And I wanna say that um, Code Pink is part of the International um, People's Assembly. Uh, it's part of um, one of the, part, the partners that's putting this on. One of the other things I'm a founder of is the People's Forum in, in New York, which is another one of our partners. Um, we have a great crew that is that been working really hard to make this beautiful and engaging and, and a model for, for how we be. Um, so uh, at the International People's Assembly, we just organized a hundred youth of the members in the organizations in the United States. 
and they went to Cuba for a week for, for May Day. Um, but two of them were uh, two code pinkers um, that, were in, that were in their 30s. And I just want to remind us, those who have been to Cuba, those who love Cuba, is, you know, the 20 to 30 year olds, they don't know about Cuba, which is always a shock for me. It's like they knew nothing. I, you know, I was shocked. They knew nothing. And to watch these young women come back blown away. You know, it's like, why? Why are Americans so stupid? Is because we're we're blocked from all the other ways people can live and how humanity can live in ways that are so inspiring and so beautiful, and that they don't live out of hate. They live out of love and care for each other. And that even in the midst of these sanctions that are starving themselves them to death, there is beauty. And and they were just blown away that people would make them meals that had nothing. You know, it's like going to Iran where we're starving them to death and people have nothing and they're feeding you their last meal. We forgot what that looks like in the selfishness and in the self-centeredness of this empire that we live in. And we need to nourish our young people with that. They need to feel that instead of social media and the hate that is and the, the necessity to be a certain way um, gets, you know, pummeled into them every day. So uh, the other thing is that you can also come to DC for the, the convergence of the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, Code Pink is the um, uh, convening the, the anti-militarism uh, organizations. We already have 50 that are coming and we're gonna share the message of the costs of war um, and, you know, uh, that our, you know, we want money for the poor, not for war, or is our t-shirt for the occasion. But we're also going to share, you know, where the money, the trillion dollars that just this year is going to war that we couldn't even get Build Back Better past, but we can get weapons that kill people through and that kill the planet. So we're going to be um, in the march and listening to the, 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 the messages of the poor people that will be on stage while sharing you know, what we need instead of weapons. We need books, we need food, we need healthcare. And we'll be um, uh, making those very visible in the March. So if you wanna come and be visible with us, we have lots of ways to engage you and also to be with the, the community across the, the country um, that's coming. We have buses coming from many different cities. Chicago, there's a whole 40, bus full of anti-militaristic young people called uh, the Peace Collective. So I invite you into those. Um, I invite you to wear your messages of peace. Um, I've got love on today, but um, I've got peace <laughs> behind me. Um, you know, to wear them and create conversations wherever you go. Uh, this week, this last weekend, um, we went to the Santa Monica Mall and um, did a march up and down with um, educating, not not, it's not the time to have a sign out because it's not obvious what, what's happening. It's a fog of war. So instead of like being on the street corners in um, Westwood, we need to be at farmer's markets, at malls, where people stopped and had conversations with us. Not only had conversations, but we had a Russian stop and, and do a little teach-in for us about who Ukrainians are and who Russians are and how they're the same people and they need to be loving each other and they don't need US imperialistic engagement that you know messes up communities. It already messed up the Middle East. Why does it need to mess up Ukraine? Uh, so he gave us a little history lesson on who was who and why it was happening. And not only that, but what happens in Russia and what they've seen, you know, the way their brains are on the fog of war, you know, it, describing it no different than how our brains are on this fog of war and how the Russians have seen for the last four years, you know, Nazis in the Donbass beheading and hanging uh, Russians and they're, you know, how does that make them feel? And do we not understand that it's not Putin, it's the Russian people. He's got an 89% popularity rating and he was forced to do this by the people. So, you know, that it's super complex. And when you get out and you start talking about it and you be human with others, it makes us all come back to our humanity and be able to think from the place where we're really intelligent, caring, compassionate, empathetic people, because who are peace activists? We're peace activists because our hearts are, are big and empathetic and caring. We cannot let that be weaponized by war. So um, 
that's a little bit of what I wanted to share, but mostly I wanted to answer questions and see how everyone else is feeling in the fog of war. So I, Dave's had his hand up for a while. So I guess Dave, you're first and then Carol Francis. Hi, Jody. It's great to see you uh, again. And uh, I, uh, you, I think you really hit the nail on the head when you said that negotiations will go nowhere. These are not your exact words, but the negotiations which are at least formally taking place now between Ukraine and Russia, those negotiations will go nowhere as, until the United States participates in those negotiations. And, and forget about NATO, the US is the godfather of NATO. It's a gang and the US is the godfather. So, um, I called the White House comments line and left a, a, a message there with a very uh, diligent volunteer. I write letters to our Congressman, uh, Ted Lieu. I write letters to our senators. And it's astonishing to me that Bernie Sanders and every member of the squad voted to give $40 billion more worth of weapons to uh, Ukraine. How the weapons are gonna get there, we don't know. Uh, whether they'll get there, we don't know. Um, but the arms manufacturers must be very pleased right now. So I guess, I, I am really flummoxed. The media uh, are putting out war propaganda. There are almost no cracks in the, in the, in the facade of the war propaganda. As you, and you pointed this out, that if people are, sorry, people I respect are saying, yes, go, go Ukraine. And um, I'm, I'm, showing uh, a Russian flag now because I, I'm in sympathy with the mothers and the fathers and the brothers and sisters of the soldiers who have been killed or are in captivity right now in Ukraine. Uh, so I guess uh, to, to achieve the goal that you laid out, which is get Biden to sit down at the table with the other people, uh, stop forcing Zelensky to keep on striving for victory when his people are bleeding and fleeing and dying. Uh, how, how do we, uh, you're spot on. How do we, how do we do that? I, and and, and uh, to begin with our demonstration, is going to help. It's going to bring attention to the issue. It's going to show that not everybody is waving the yellow and blue flag. Um, but do you have any further advice to share with us about how we can achieve that goal of forcing, it's going to have to be forcing Biden, persuading him to sit down at that table because as you pointed out, the talks are going nowhere and they will go nowhere until Biden says, OK, uh, I, I'm going to participate. Uh, I, I feel like we're rewarding aggression, but, you know, the, the right thing to do right now is sit down and talk. Thanks, uh, yeah, Jody. Thank thanks for being there, here. There's a lot in there, so I'm going to try to pick pieces. So first of all, you know, Pr Pramila Jayapal is one of the co-founders of Code Pink. She wrote our first letter. And um, I would talk to her and she says, I'm under my desk. She has a resolution that she wanted the members to get to Biden that says diplomacy now. And every time she says she sticks it up, she gets chopped off. So the, you know, like the thing is you have to go back 
and, and look at what's happened. Like you can look at this about Roe v. Wade, you can look about it about the war. Um, those people that want something, they do a long strategic work forward. So let's just talk about the weapons industry. I mean, it was President Eisenhower who warned us against the military industrial complex. So like that's in the fifties. That warning was real. He saw the greed that drives war. The fact that we have war for profit and, and that the money goes from our taxes, it goes to the, the war profiteer, they spend the money buying Congress and then they get more and more money. And then when you make weapons, they're gonna be used, right? Because we need more weapons. And, and like I was saying in the beginning, how many places those weapons are already being used all the time. So, you know, <laughs> to answer your question, it's it started a long time ago. So we have to start at the place of we're not gonna move this in a minute. You know, Dave, it's, it's like, I appreciate the question, but what what we've done as peace activists as we've we've like, we gotta do this, we gotta do this, and we we try that, we try that, but building, building is how it happens. And I watch the right build the mechanism to this place. But I also want to say that we don't hold our leaders accountable. Biden, may I remind you, was the person in the Thomas hearings who had on his desk the proof that Thomas had bought porn that would have supported her argument and would have turned votes against Thomas. But he decided not to support the woman, but support the man, not only support him, but vote for him in a vote that was four people apart. Biden had me arrested the day he was supposed to be saying no to war because he was the Senate head of the Foreign uh, Affairs Committee. And instead of saying, no, we're not going to give Bush our votes for this illegal, immoral, unjust war, he said, We've got to go to Iraq and bomb them to peace. He said that. And I got up and said, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. And he said, arrest her. So, you know, Dave, it's a, it's a, it doesn't happen by osmosis. It happens by long planned, sustained work. And we don't hold our leaders accountable. We, 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 and I'm not talking about us, but when we say we live in a democracy, I wanna remind everybody, I ran the presidential campaign in 92, that's 30 years ago, that said, if you don't get money out of politics, it doesn't matter what you care about because you will lose. Mm -hmm. So if we create the conditions for war, for violence against our body, for all of these things, then, those are the conditions we live in. And we've got to create other conditions. And it's gonna happen, unfortunately, slowly. We, we have a military that's owned by billionaires. We have the weapons industry that puts, that's like everything's down at Wall Street, but the weapons industry. And we, us taxpayers, we fund them to own Congress, to take the money away from all the needs of the people. So we've got to start from scratch. And right now in the fog of war, we've just got to remind people how dumb it is to vote more money for weapons. We, you know, it's just like, remember, remember Korea, remember Vietnam, remember Afghanistan, remember Iraq. I mean, can we just get people back out of the fog of war is our jobs. Because until we can do that, and then they can join you, Dave, in calling the White House every day, which we all should be doing. I do that every day too, Dave. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's to know that we're being, it's like, what has to happen? Okay, diplomacy has to happen. I'm going to be that one citizen that's calling. And then I'm going to share it on social media every day. So other people might see it and go, I'm frustrated too. I'm going to join you in that call until we can build that wave. We have a wave to build. And that's why I say you have to be present. You have to be visible. You have to bring your friends and it ain't going to happen right away. It's going to be really ugly, but until we like also hold our hands 
with each other, not expect perfection out of each other, be generous and kind with each other. I mean, I have to tell you a little story. Um, um, I saw Reverend Barber speak at Hillary Clinton's DNC and, and, and I, and um, he's, he, he really stole the show because you could tell he wasn't really behaving and he spoke for longer than anyone. And he said that um, uh, pa uh, brown skin Palestinian Jew. And I knew that that wasn't approved. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love you. But you talked about poverty and racism, but you didn't talk about militarism. He says, I'm from North Carolina. What do I know about militarism? So I'm the place you always call when he wants to know, you know, like teach me about the war economy and militarism and the peace economy. And so we're, you know, really good friends about like, what's, what's this thing, militarism that creates racism and poverty. And so I'd been talking to him about Ukraine and sharing, you know, kind of debunking the lies that he was, and he wrote a letter to his community and in it, it could be read like it was okay to send weapons to Ukraine. And so the peace community was up, you know, like on our coalition, on our listserv going, what just happened? And I go, that's not, I know better. I, that's not what he believes. I've been talking to him every night, I know. And so I wrote him really quickly. He wrote, I said, what, why, why all of a sudden did you change positions and want war for you, weapons for Ukraine? He goes, I never had that position. Who, who's crazy? Who's saying that? Now, that's not me. And I said, well, you better read the email that went out with your name on it. And he read it and he says, oh no, the editors changed my language. They, they didn't know, you know, say change the language. So the next, so this week he wrote in his letter that came, comes out every week, Oh dear, I just wanna make sure everybody knows there was a mistake in last week's letter. No, I am not for more weapons to Ukraine. No, you know, no, I don't believe in that militarism. You know, he like laid out that he'd been anti-militarist even in a, and he lives near a base, even with the base near him, you know, with people hating on him, but he never not had that position. But I wanna tell you that people in the peace community had already beat him up in articles, had already taken him down. And I said, we're not gonna win this way. He's your, he's your friend, you know who he is. Why wouldn't you accept that there was some mistake made first and call him and say, what's up here? But instead it was attack by three leaders of three peace organizations. So, the reminder is that we need to remember to love and care. Our practice, all of us, our practice is not to fight with anyone about what's happening right now. It's not to get in an argument, but to lead with example. Here's a solution. It's, you know, on the Code Pink website, we have an FAQ that lays out very succinctly what you need to do. The peace agreement, it already exists. It's what Biden needed to sit at the table with and make sure happened before Putin started bombing. A comprehensive, what we need now is a comprehensive ceasefire, withdrawal of Rus Russian forces, a Ukraine commitment to international neutrality, an agreement, a referendum on the future of the Donbass regions um, whose civil war has led to this Russian invasion. You know, let's, let's remember that. The U.S. can support by agreeing to lift, lift sanctions if Russia keeps its side of the peace agreement, committing to humanitarian assistance to Ukraine instead of weapons, ruling out further escalation of war such as a no-fly zone, and agreeing to end NATO expansion, and a commitment to renewed diplomacy with Russia. Super simple. That's all you have to say. You don't have to get in an argument about who started it, what, what it's like. That's not necessary right now. What's necessary right now is that militarism isn't the answer, has never been the answer. And that what Biden did, which is even more crazy, is he put the weapons and the care for people together. So here it is, we're gonna kill you and care for you, the ones of you that survive. Like that, just what that does to humanity itself, what that does to a member of Congress. So. If you, the, the brutality that is happening right now in Congress, the holding guns to people's heads to do things they don't believe in, that's gonna affect them. It's gonna affect how people think about war. It's like, if Congress does it, it might be, must be right, right? 
Yep. So we have a I, we have a big hill to climb. Uh, I think it was like rocks to take down <laughs> in the way of truth and in the way of love and in the way of care. So think about it as we you know think about it as brick by brick, um, because what we can't exhaust ourselves because it's a long road. We literally need to change the culture of this country to become a peace economy culture instead of a war economy culture. And unfortunately, we have, you can see on the Code Pink website, 21 ways to divest ourselves from the war economy culture that are our own personal habits that we need to break. And I would start, you know, as a community, that's what we do at Code Pink. We work on breaking them every day and we call each other out on them in loving and beautiful ways. And we laugh about it because being human is always very funny. And it's the place where we can find each other is in the humor, hu humor of what it is to be human and that we're everyone in this is being human. And unfortunately, too many people are being used by the fog of war, but that's always been true. Um, that the media and the State Department have used people, but now those tools are more refined or more violent and are more disturbing um, to what they ca cause to the very soul of our nature. So I, Dave, I hope I addressed everything you brought up, but Carol Francis, you're next. <laughs> um, I want to really get into ICJP's present um, being part of the June event, the People's Summit. I have been the uh, ICJP has had events in which we try to recognize <clears throat> all the organizations that sponsor it and find out that none of the sponsors are there. They want <clears throat> they want their name on the flyers, but they don't want to work at getting their people out. I want it's really important to me the ICJP gets people out, not just for the panel that we're organizing, because I've been at a panel where I was sitting at the front gate to not the panel, but the left coast forum. And somebody would sign in and say, I'm doing a workshop for my organization and, and hurry off and an hour later, she's back and leaving. We don't want that. We want ICJP people to be there and to um, to wear ICUJP on them and to let other activists know that ICUJP is on the page of what's going on. So um, I, <clears throat> part of that is just showing up for the event and not just our event, but it's, I mean, it's, a weekend, right? So how many other things can you have planned for that weekend? Just, you know, get, get there for as much as possible. And you talked about how each of us would love being there. And I want to talk about how the ICUJP and the organizations um, planning it can build a stronger movement. So could you talk about what's happening in LA to organize the People's Summit and what we could do to plug in? Sure. Um, so the, the, um, the, the convening organizations, we get together three times a week. Um, I'm on two committees and then we get together for, you know, bringing reporting back. Um, there's, um, we've pretty much out of um, each one of our organizations assigned two staff members. So those two staff members are working like daily on everything, you know, like, and so it's about a, a crew of 18. Um, and they're working on the locations, they're working on the artists, they're working on the speakers, they're 
working on visas for people that are traveling. They're working on where can people stay? I mean, that's another thing is if anybody is around downtown and has an extra bed, we have people coming from all over. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking for housing. Um, people are working on the transportation. It's a super complex because, you know, it's what we really wanna do is raise up the voices that are coming that, you know, to be different than the um, the peop the summit of the Americas, and instead of being centered in white northern um, U.S. issues, to be centered around the issues of those that are coming to visit, um, and how do we create forms for them, and how do we also create uh, a teaching for those that come from the different communities? I mean, we have over almost 200 now coalition members that are bringing folks. We have buses coming from Nevada and, and Arizona and New Mexico. And so it's more like, we're just trying to figure out how do we create something that inspires everyone that comes to that there is a different way. And there is you know this way that allows um, everyone to be able to govern in the way that they want to be governed. So that's what we hope um, will, will be the experience. And that, um, you know, that those that live in LA will find each other because it's also a mix of people that don't necessarily get together in LA. Um, and so I would, I would, you know, everybody should wear their, their t-shirt and, and, you know, be there as, um, who you are and, and the message you bring of, you know, love and peace. Um, so uh, there's, um, if there's, so things that we're still looking for um, are artists that, from Latin America that might be, you know, living in Los Angeles that can display their work. We, we have a big gallery that we've put together at um, Trade Tech. Um, we've got, they've given us as much, many walls as we want. Um, and so we're, we're looking for muralists or people to work with the muralists. We'll have um, screen printing, um, you know, ways to engage. Uh, we're gonna have, oh, um, we have, you know, a, a, you, you know, you can have a, a table if you want and table or, you know, just be handing things out. Um, there's, um, there's book, there's gonna be like a book, a lot of booksellers um, and uh, lots of amazing books that um, you can't get on Amazon. Um, so, you know, it's more and lots of, you know, the auditoriums where you can listen and also the space where everybody can be gathering and sharing and eating and um, getting to know each other. So it, it's not a weekend, by the way, uh, it's the eighth through the 10th. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna exercise chair's privilege. Please identify the dates, the times, and the locations of the People's Summit. If there is a flyer, post it on screen. If there are details, put them in the chat. Uh, I think many people on this screen, including myself, were confused about the reference to the weekend and the dates. So the starting place for organizing uh, is when, where, and what. Please help us. So we'll be, there'll be ways to engage that start on the fourth um, with, you know, getting things ready. If you want to be part of the team, um, uh, you know, just register and you'll be reached out to. And I think there's a place in the registration that says, you know, I want to volunteer or, you know, I, so, um, and, uh, I don't know who who represents you at the coalition call, um, but um, uh, you know I'm not sure who of of all any of you is on the coalition call. If nobody is, then um, I'll be happy to introduce you to the coalition team to make sure you're included in the coalition calls, um, so that you know you you know that's how we let all the coalition members know what's what's up and where they can engage and where they're needed. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure who, but I put in the, um, the people summit 2022.org is the site. If you want to go there, that's where you can register. Um, we're also going to have um, 
uh, translation of most of the panels because a lot of them uh, will be in uh, uh, Spanish or um, you know other languages. So um, yeah. Um, if I can make a short announcement, uh, I, I do want to make sure we get all the questions in for people. So um, if you can uh, make your question brief and Jody, I don't know how you want to handle that. Maybe take maybe two at a time or uh, you just want to plow through. That'd be great. Thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, I actually have to leave for a plane pretty soon. So um, uh, maybe then. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, Vita, you put your heart, your hand down. You had had yours. Yours was third. You put it down. So, uh, are you, you don't have a question anymore, Vita? No. Okay. Um, across the screen is Ruby and Steve and Donna and Jasmine. So, yeah, why don't each one of you ask, and then I'll answer. I just wanted to say thank you. I just really appreciate all the the peace, the peace power that you're you're carrying out into the world and that you're carrying with you. I really appreciate everything. And I look forward to the feast to the summit and meeting you and and um and really working towards peace. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> you know, um I heard you say a lot of things that were happening in the past, you know, regarding Eisenhower and Biden and all these things in the military, the billionaires. But for me, in order to release the recycling of war, and that's what I call it, I've been into peace power for a long time. And it starts with the children. It starts with having the group of the children knowing it's okay for peace, you know, they have all of these programs and everything. And then it, it's also showing them the difference between anger and, and the war within themselves. So for me, as we have a peace community, there's a war community. And so we have to know that it's okay to, to work with the children on this, to give them new ideas to support them and know that they are the future. So for my thing is in recycling the power of war, let's go forward into the power of peace. So how can we do this first? How can we bring this up, get people interested in coming and doing this? And that, that's my uh, question. Well, I mean, that's 826LA. That's what I saw is like, it starts with um, the children and and that's been the core of the work at 826LA. It was like, and, you know, so many of the, the kids, cause we only serve kids that are qualified for school lunch. And so those are kids that have been, you know, don't get respect and, and haven't felt valued. So just to feel value of your own story, um, itself is peace because when we go to war, there's like no value of the other. That itself is, is a no valuing. It's not recognizing the other as human. To, to drop a bomb is, is an, an insane act. Um, and that's why so many soldiers kill themselves and so many drone pilots kill themselves because they're, they, they can't deal with the insanity that they have been cajoled to do. So um, I, I totally agree with you. And yes, modeling peace, but you know, modeling peace is, as you say, it's, it's how we be with each other, even how we deal with our own complexity as humans. How do we be together as human beings and community? Um, I, I came here once before and talked about the peace economy. And one of the things is in creating this arc, I say, that gets us through all this, it's what is it to be in community? And community is a place where there's at least two people you hate um, and that you'll probably end up loving because they're like something inside of you you haven't accepted yet. 
And if there is, if there's not somebody in the community that irritates you, you're in a cult. Um, so careful. <laughs> so, um, you know, how do we learn about the things you're talking about? We'd be about like that irritation comes from some projection and some, uh, sense of lack of power or instability or because we don't even ground our children in values anymore. I mean, why can so many people be used right now is that we've, we're not, if you're grounded to a value, you can't let that happen. You know, you'll stand in a room like uh, Barbara Lee and say, you know, no to war when everybody else is, is saying something different, but we, have to give our children th that courage and that commitment and that grounding. And um, unfortunately in the culture, they, they just get swept up and used um, other ways. So yes, a commitment to the children. Thank you. S Steve or Donna? Thank you so much as always. I I'm gonna break my question into two parts because your talk has two parts to it. Um, <clears throat> first, I think sometimes we get, we're so used to our uh, language and our organizational work. Uh, please tell this group, what is 826LA? Uh, just give us a brief explanation. Uh, Rick has put uh, the uh, website uh, in the chat. But uh, I think many of us want to learn more about that. And if you'll do that briefly, then I'll just quickly ask my second question. Oh, well, 826LA is um, Dave Eggers started 826 Valencia in San Francisco to serve the youth of San Francisco that qualified for school lunch that weren't getting the support they needed, um, first of all, to learn. And writing is, 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 is a tool that will save your life if you can write. And I wanna say some of our students have gone through uh, their last three years of high school with this homeless and are now in Harvard. Um, being able to write and express yourself and it's part of peace. It's kind of like, it's part of like being able to go inside and tell your stories it has helped. You know, 100% of, of the teachers and the parents that are polled about our program say it's like changed the kids' lives. And how that's done is that it's a volunteer. It's somebody comes and works with a child one-on-one -on -one with their homework and then works with them to write and then we publish them. So to be a published author, to be have someone help you go in and find the words to express your feelings, that's peace in itself. That's a, that's a healing in itself, but then it serves their homework. It serves their life at home. It helps their parents. So it serves the whole community. It's a holistic, it serves the teacher. It serves the parent. It serves the family. It's, it, it, it served, it has served a lot of kids that have been disturbed um, to come out of the, the knot they were in and then to become just shy. I mean, like, when you can, when you have a book where you wrote a story inside of that or a poem and it's published and it's sold on a shelf, that's so empowering. And so I don't, I've, I think we've published some 600 books every year. We take a high school and that high school is partnered with someone famous in the city that comes up with what they all write about. And then, you know, with that, that call, like, it, you know, the coach of the Lakers was what is, what is winning, you know, like what, what does victory look like? Or what is, I think his was, what was, what is, um, uh, what does it look like to be on a team and be a member of a team? Um, uh, the, you know, I've had each of the mayors do it at their high schools, you know, um, when you go to college and you're a published author, it's a whole, when I say rooted, you're rooted in yourself, you're rooted in your story. It's, it's a strong place to stand up from. And so we do this by, we have two centers, one in Mar Vista and one in Echo Park. And then we do writing rooms in, in, high, high, in high schools. And the writing room that we did in um, Luck High School, when we started, 
30% were going to college and 50% were graduating. Now 70% are going to college and 90% are graduating. So um, it's, but I also wanna say that as a volunteer, like the volunteers last night came up to me and like, whenever I get like in the fog, which is, you know, where Congress is, is that you're just inside another story and it's like irritating and you can feel it and you can't breathe and your, your shoulders are up and your, your chest is tight. I just go over and I, I, I work with the kids and I remember what it is to be human and have a fresh yes. state of mind. And, and then I like can come back and I can do my work. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's that it is the peace economy and, and, you know, sign up, be a volunteer. It's, it's a nourishing experience. And then one, like five years ago, I realized we, I had, I was working with junior high kids that did not know how to read. So then we started a reading program on the weekends. Teaching somebody to read has got to be the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. When that happens in their brain and you see that, it's just like, I don't know. It's just like, there's no no high quite like that. So that's right. um, the antidote to war. <laughs> well, real quickly, let's offline talk about this because ICUJP has an arts and justice program. And I think if it's possible to invite uh, Dave Eggers and you back uh, with some of the students and the success stories you've had uh, through 826LA uh, in a future program, uh, I think we, we would love that. And I can see heads shaking. Uh, quickly, as my second question, there's the, the fog of war, but there's the fog of peace. To say absolutely that we don't know what's happening in Ukraine, I mean, what we know is that there has been aggression and that people are dying in Ukraine uh, and bombs are dropping and buildings and schools are being destroyed. So we know that. Um, accountability also includes accountability for uh, Putin. And I wanna ask you, given your long roots, what is the nature of the peace movement in Russia? Uh, has Code Pink previously to this war developed connections to the peace movement in Russia? And can you give us any sense of their struggle? I know that over 15,000 protesters have been arrested or jailed in Russia. Um, is there some way we can support and encourage the peace movement in Russia? Well, I think the peace movement in Russia is the same as the peace movement in the United States. It's not being listened to. Uh, they're a lot harsher on, the, on those in um, Russia than here. Um, I've, we're talking to some that have been already arrested four and five times. Um, so, and that a couple that have, you know, and they're all trying to find their way out. We saw the Pussy Riot um, member got out uh, just this week. So yeah, it's not a safe place. I mean, Russia um, has used the same hate, the same othering, the same you know violence. It's the same patriarch. It's it's a horrible patriarchal oppressionist structure that has built a peace movement for a very long time. And it's a peace movement that's been around that, I mean, since the seventies, I've uh, been talking to them, many people about, you know, nuclear weapons and we've been connected around ending nuclear weapons. So they're there, they're, um, uh, some manage technologically to stay uh, hidden. Um, many are trying to find their way out of the country. Many have been in jail. Um, we also started a, co a coalition as soon as the bombing started. It's called peaceinukraine.org. Um, and I'll put that in. If you want to see, um, so it's a global coalition um, that we've been working together for peace for 20 years. Um, and we've been working to end NATO for 20 years. Um, it's our no on NATO coalition. Um, uh, if you want to see some of those webinars, we, we definitely bring our peace activists from both Ukraine and um, Russia in to talk. So it's um, peace in Ukraine. 
Um, and uh, there's many really, really good webinars there that I would encourage if you want to get you know strong. Uh, there's the last one was two hours long, great voices from around the world. Um, and uh, so, you know, really just to, because it's important when you live in an empire not to think you know. So, you know, listening to others. And, and so, yes, we listen to the peace activists. We, when we have a petition that we send every week to Biden from the peace activists in Russia calling on him to, to, for diplomacy. Um, so, yeah. And they've really helped us understand what it's like to be in Russia, you know, that it's that they're they're the minority also, and they're a small minority, and you know, the complexity of politics there and the uh, complexity of what has been created in Russia, like what has been created in the US. It's it's not a short-term thing. It didn't just happen. I mean, one of the peace activists said to me, you don't understand. Putin actually didn't want to bomb Ukraine. He was forced to by the um his parliament. You know, he was the, the leadership force, and he would have been kicked out if he didn't, you know, so we identify it as Putin, but we forget it's a country, and we forget mm -hmm. you know, that they, they've been driven to their own militarism, from their own nationalism, from their own witnessing of um, the people they love being, you know, murdered by Nazis, whatever is true about that or not true, that's the movie they're getting, you know, so uh, we're all on a fog of war is what I meant, um, Steve, not that what we can see is happening, but what's happening behind the scenes and why, and that's, you know, always a, a fog for everyone. So, um, yeah. And uh, anybody that wants to call on Putin to, to go to the um, negotiating table, feel free. The, the Russian peace activists would appreciate that also as they call Biden too. Um, so I... I actually have two more minutes before I have to leave. Yeah. To so Donna, you're, you didn't get done. Right. <laughs> um, just uh, real quickly. <clears throat> I, I, I heard about the slow, long process, but I still, you know, want to stand somewhere with my sign and why not a vigil uh, at Washington for Biden to negotiate? I, I know that the Quakers are starting to activate <laughs> and um, there must be a lot of groups that, that would possibly join. That's one question. And the other is how to how to call out the weapon manufacturers profiting from this and this is that keeps it going. We that's do all question. day every day. That's so if you're you know that's those steps, the slow process, a vigil is part of that. The you know, right now what we're doing is we're disrupting all the weapons manufacturers shareholders meetings. Um so I'm off to um DC for Raytheon. Um, so yeah, we're disrupting their shareholder meetings, calling for even just a, a commitment to human rights out of their weapons and they're denying votes on that. So you're not even reading about what's happening at these weapon manufacturer shareholder meetings. And um, yes, um, we're out in the streets every day in DC. It's not, uh, by the way, we have cut the Pentagon, a campaign that started on 9-12. After 20 years of the war on terror, we started the movement for cut the Pentagon because cut the money in the Pentagon affects all of us and the planet we live on. So we say cut the Pentagon for people, planet, peace, and a future. And that's a coalition of all kinds of groups that work on other issues because cutting the Pentagon is necessary. And we can show you that we've had you know, tried to stop weapon sales because then they weapons kill people and Congress keeps voting for these weapon sales. And we can show you, Democrat and Republican, that those votes keep happening because they're funded by the weapons companies. So we actually have something called called a disarm, which is working um, and you could look it up because there's members of Congress in, in LA that need attention um, to tell them, no, you can't take money from weapons or you're a murderer. You know, and we have, you know, even Bernie still takes web money from weapons manufacturers. So we have to cut them off. They have to be pariah. But if they're not pariah with you and you're not calling on your Congress member and saying they're pariah, they are murderers. They are murderers. If you're watching what has happened in Ukraine, that is what a weapon does. And it's disgusting and it's horrible and it's violent. And so by making the weapons and selling them, and now we're selling to, you know, we're selling to people that are horrific to Turkey and Egypt and 
Saudi Arabia. And what do you think is going to happen with those weapons or what happened? Like, look what happened to them in, in Libya when we just bombed the shit out of it, killed their leader. And then it's just full on mayhem that has weaponized the entire North Africa. Um, unfortunately, we know a lot about Ukraine and nothing about our own devastation and what we do in our name with our tax dollars. So, but we are love. We, we love Cuba. We know there are models for beautiful ways to live. It's up to us to start there, to be that, to be the turn to the tuning fork to that, to be an individual, like pick, pick a farmer's market and go every Sunday. We have flyers on the um, Peace in Ukraine site. We have flyers in our, on our Ukraine page at Code Pink. Um, we have a FAQ that you can go with. And when people want to ask questions that have facts that can support you, um, just help people come out of the fog of war is our job right now. And um, to call on those in power in the United States for diplomacy, not more weapons. And to continue to love all of those around the world that are suffering from weapons right now, whether they're in Russia or Ukraine or the sanctions in Iran and, um, or, you know, palms are still falling on Iraq and people are starving to death in Afghanistan. Um, you know, in Sudan and Somalia, you know, they're, they're uh, in Mali right now with the French pulling out or, um, you know, in Haiti, in Cuba, in Venezuela. There's just so many places where, how can we keep our hearts open? Well, I keep my heart open because I'm engaged every day. So don't also let the heart break. The engagement is the way you nourish your heart and being together is how we nourish each other. So thank you for always pulling us together in love and in peace. I'm super grateful for all of you and I have to go catch my plane. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, they. Uh, I tried to hang on to the wing. It doesn't work. So uh, Jody, thank you very, very much. Thank you.